Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we're going to talk about the first in an illustrious series, Alternate Generals, I'm Part so, 1. I'm so excited. Edited by our boy, Harry Turtledove. He's, ah. he's back, finally. <laughs> We've missed him. Yeah, I certainly have. I certainly, certainly have. So, you know, as par for the course with these sorts of things, it's a short story compilation. <laughs> and that's good. I think for alternate history, that's a good format. Yeah, yeah. They don't overstay their welcome. You know, you get they a get nice... To the, they get to the point pretty quickly. You get a good variety. You get mm -hmm. ancient stuff, modern stuff, mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, you get interesting ways of telling a story. You've got stuff like... Uh, we'll talk about it later, but like some of these stories are just like quotes just a big long list. Well, there's a series of like newspaper clippings, excerpts from books that supposedly existed, mm -hmm. other things like that. It's really good. First person, third person, that yeah, kind of stuff. It's but, good. Um, but yeah, I think there's something like, what is it, 16, 17 stories in this one? Maybe a little less, some 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. but it's the, a good number of stories. The gimmick being that either there's a general from our world who are in kind of different circumstances mm -hmm. or someone who was not a general is a general and yeah. you know that it's kind of military stuff. focused which yes. is the best that's the best part of history yes good job yeah <laughs> yay no one cares about economic history <laughs> Boo. who cares about marx when you can talk about carabiner kr 98s we can read the next short story compilation, Alternate Secretaries of Agriculture. <laughs> That'll be the new. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Alternate Secretaries of Housing and Urban Development. Yes. Like, <laughs> who's the current one at the moment? I can't remember. I have no idea. It's, um, who is the, okay. who is the very low tempo Republican candidate? The one. The oh, one? Ben Carson. Ben Carson is. Yeah. Yes. Ben Carson is. I once saw a guy who had a bumper sticker that said, America needs a doctor. Stat Carson 2016. America needs a doctor. Ron Paul. <laughs> America needs an OBGYN. <laughs> Stat. <laughs> America's got a yeast infection <laughs> that only Ron Paul can fix. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no, but we're off topic. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> but um, so the, the first story in this compilation is an ancient story. It's mm -hmm. called The Test of Gold, and it's written by Lillian Stewart Carl. And uh, this is a part of history I didn't really know very much about till I read a Wikipedia article yeah. <laughs> after I read it and realized. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know much about it either. I, I struggle a little bit with the more ancient ones to see the, the change, the point of diversion. It's odd because a lot of these ancient stories, it's almost like they're averse to making big sweeping changes i mean there is one a little bit in this story but for the most part they just kind of go halfway and and just have the thing basically happen the same way as they did in real history like for instance in in alternate warriors where there's the the story where jesus where he dies under different circumstances but it's basically the same thing the end result is the same well here with this is that you just have to have more of a knowledge of ancient roman history because this suffers from a problem i think for some of these stories have and maybe this is just because i'm not a classicist or whatever is that i'm like well what's the divergence here i mean it's not clear it's not like oh julius caesar he didn't die okay i get that yeah but yeah I, I think Boudica or Boudica, she's a lot more well known in Britain because she's kind of a folk hero over mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And this story is about uh, Queen Boudica, who is the queen of a tribe of barbarians called the Aisni. I think that's how that's pronounced. Yeah. I've seen them in Rome Total War, but other than that, <laughs> I know nothing about them. But apparently in, in real history, there was this tribe in northeast England. It was this tribe that was a tributary of Rome, and Rome kind of gave them a raw deal uh, raided the area, uh, stole Raw a lot deal. of stuff. <laughs> Raw deal starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and then Boudicca got in a car and then drove around a construction site <laughs> shooting people with MP5s. But there's weird extended barrel things yeah, on it. Yeah, well, because they're not actually MP5s. They're, um, they're like the civilian model. Oh, whatever. Yeah, get out of town. Just go to IMFDB. They'll tell you all about that sort of stuff. Good website. It's a fantastic website. It's great. They know more about guns than we could ever possibly imagine. Yeah, they get all persnickety and like, actually, um... This leaf sight is on a, you know, a Nambu Mark 7. Like, oh, no. <laughs> no one knows that, but good for you. 
Okay, but we're getting off topic here. But, but yes, but Boudica, Boudica. So basically, she got betrayed by Rome, and she became the, 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 the centerpiece of a populist rebellion against Rome. She and a bunch of other tribes marched on Londinium, burned it to the ground. The Romans closed in, and there was a battle, and Boudica died, and the rebellion died with her. And that's precisely what happens in this story. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's pretty much precisely what happens. Um, <laughs> the point of view character for the story is some Roman guy who goes to her village and the two of them kind of have a relationship with one another. And at one point she she does a gios on him, which uh, I don't know what that is. It's like from Celtic mythology. It's it. Yeah. I think it's mostly an Irish mythology wherein you're bound to do something. You've been given a fate to. Huh. like OK follow some kind of command is it like a device or is it like a spell i think it's a spell it's like magical and stuff um magic 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 you know i'm sorry to get on so many dang tangents barely <laughs> once we've started this episode <laughs> but there's actually a uh, alternate history television show yeah. called code Geass mm. from a little country called japan it's an alternate history thing it's where britain has a different line of kings they're like these weird wizards or something and oh, i don't like this already <laughs> you don't like it already uh well you're not going to like the next part because uh <laughs> so the american revolution fails everything else is exactly the same by the way but the american revolution happens it fails because benjamin franklin betrays the rest of the founding fathers ben <laughs> not ben it's not all about the benjamins for me anymore mm, yeah oh <laughs> But then later on, Napoleon still happens precisely as, as it did in our history. And Napoleon invades Britain and takes Great Britain, all of it, Great Britain and Ireland. Damn. And uh, the royal family goes to North America, where they start the Holy Britannian Empire, and then proceeds to draca the whole damn planet <laughs> over the next, like, 200 years oh, or so. Geez. And then there's giant robots... And oh, by the way, there's like this dumb Gios stuff where they can command people to do stuff. That's dumb. It's pretty silly. It's pretty mm -hmm. damn silly. Yeah. Um, there's a part in the series where the main character is explaining how he can use Gioses to make people do stuff. And he's like talking to this lady and he's like, you know, and I could even say something like, you know, I command you to kill all Japanese people and you'd have to do it. I mean, isn't that interesting? And she's like, yes, very interesting. And then walks out of the room and like picks up a submachine gun and just starts shooting people. <laughs> Whoa, what? <laughs> That's really stupid. Oh, God. Um, well, in this one, yeah, going back to the test of gold. Yes. Uh, she makes him drink a tea that has melted gold and mistletoe in it. Which is poisonous. <laughs> yeah, mistletoe is poisonous. <laughs> it's gold is chemically inert. Yes. But um, given the way that they probably worked with it back then, probably poisonous too. Yeah, yeah. At the time, given that they probably weren't exactly the safest way to go about it. Yeah, it's not like this is pure gold or anything. It's probably going to have something yeah, else in exactly. there. So. Mistletoe. Like, even if you don't die, you're going to be puking your guts out <laughs> afterward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ugh. But uh, yeah, he tags along with Boudicca because she gives him a gios to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So it's like Liar Liar, basically. Ah, Test of Gold, starring Jim Carrey. <laughs> Jim Carrey, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, he kind of tags along. Boudicca dies under the exact same circumstances. And then he goes off to live with one of Boudicca's daughters, pretending that she's his daughter, and then later she's his wife. It's very strange. That's pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, unfortunately, it suffers from a weakness. Maybe this is just from our basis, but... We're just not as strong in this area of history, so it's, you know, harder to get into it. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Tradition. Tradition. By... <laughs> Tradition. <laughs> By Elizabeth Moon. Not Fiddler on the Roof. Not a Fiddler on the Roof story. Um, it's basically about, so there's these two ships, the Breslau and the Goben, were these German Navy ships in 1914 that, I guess they kind of escaped from the British. They went to Turkey. The Ottoman Turks took over and actually used them later on. Mm -hmm. Interesting fact that Karl Dernitz later Grand Admiral and uh, briefly head of state for Germany at the end of World War II. And also a person who was on... The World at War. The World at War. Yeah. 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 Appearance on the World at War. Yeah. At yeah. He, he was actually on those ships in that time. But basically the point of this is that the British instead sink them, hmm. these ships, and take a lot of casualties. But 
Ottoman Turks don't join World War One. Yeah, yeah. It's, which actually has more interesting stuff to it than these two ships being sunk. So no Gallipoli, for no one. No Gallipoli, no Siege of Kut, no Baghdad, no Lawrence of Arabia. Mm, that's a big one. Oh, no. What is Peter O'Toole going to do? <laughs> Who is he going to play? Yeah. Arins. Oh, Arins. Arins. And Omar Sharif. Omar Sharif. Who is also in the Dr. film. Dr. Zhivago. Well, I was going to say top secret. <laughs> he was in top secret as well. It's <laughs> a fine film. A fine One film. of the world's best bridge players, actually. I heard something about that. Yeah. That's crazy. But yeah. Long story short, this story, good, a little long. Hmm. So, so, wait a second. What kind of possessions did the British get... From the Ottomans. I know there's the Mandate of Palestine. Well, they got the, yeah, the Mandate of Palestine. They got Transjordan. Okay. Kuwait. Well, the French got that. No, Transjordan was British. Oh, really? Yeah, Syria and Lebanon, Iraq, Kuwait, Hmm. Transjordan, and Palestine. What about the Aden Protectorate? Did that already exist? I think, oh, that may have already existed in some form, because I know that the Ottomans ran down into part of Yemen, I think, but not the whole thing. So I think the Aden Protectorate existed before then. Mm -hmm. Um, And then obviously, like, the Hejaz became part of Saudi Arabia. So, and, and then all the Saudi Arabia stuff happened because of World War One. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, King Saud. Yeah. Faisal. Ibn Saud. Yeah. Faisal. Yeah. Mm. All the kings of Saudi Arabia since the first one have been sons of the first one. <laughs> like Salman <laughs> is a son of the first king of Saudi Arabia. That's so crazy. Is that Ibn Saud who had a ton of children. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it, it's it's an interesting idea. It doesn't get into that idea at all. It just ends with yeah. The oh, ship we sank sinking. them. Woo! Yeah. Woo! You'd never know the whole Ottoman Ottoman thing unless did some research. It's like I had to do research because I'd never heard of this. Mm-hmm. I had no, and I had no idea mm-hmm. why the Ottomans joined World War One. Like mm-hmm. no clue. There are many reasons. It wasn't just. I know why the uh, the Turks joined World War Two though. Because it was about two weeks away from being <laughs> done. <laughs> Yay, we've joined you. They did join, and they, they really put in a good effort. Yeah. It's always easy to join World War II in Feb- January or February of 1945. <laughs> Just like, um, what was it? Who was the last person? Like Bulgaria or Hungary or something like that? Or did Hungary stick it out to the very, very Hungary end? Hungary stuck it out to the end. Romania switched sides. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Bulgaria switched sides, too, I think. But, um... Good story, good story, Mm -hmm. but let's move on to the next one. Yay, boats. Boats. There's a, you know, people love boats. There's a lot of boat fiction out there. Don't don't call it a boat to someone who's a real Mm. person of the sea. How about... If you you tell it a boat to someone who's in the Navy, they'll get really angry at you and tell you it's a ship. uh, A boat is on a ship. uh, Ahem. What about an untersea boat? Yeah. All right? Put you in your place. All right? I know. Well... But yeah, a vessel. It's a vessel. Bodie McBoatface. Bodie Shippy McBoatface. <laughs> Shippy McShip face. <laughs> vessel, vessel McVessel face. Uh, yeah. Vasily. Vasily. Yeah. Vasily Zaitsev. <laughs> We're playing word association here. <laughs> Vasily Zaitsev. Jude Law. You know, a, a Ray t- Fine. Oh, it's, no, it's Joseph Fines, isn't that? Joseph Fiennes. Yeah, he was in that show where he was Michael Jackson very briefly. Really? Yeah, and then they pulled it because he was a white guy. Oh. Oh. (laughs) Also in Shakespeare in Love, boo, which won the Best Picture Oscar the year that Saving Private Ryan came out. It's a damn crime. Yeah, I know, right? It's ridiculous. People are dumb. Mm -hmm. They don't know good art when they see it, you know? know. Mm Mm-hmm. So next, the Republic for which it stands, by uh, Brad Linaweaver. Yeah. So basically, in this one, you have Julius Caesar. It's the night before the Ides of March, and he decides he's going to be Cincinnatus. He's going <laughs> to give up his power. It's going to go back to the Senate. So he's basically going to change the whole direction of his whole life mm. on a dime. Yes. Because the reason they kill him is because they suspected he was going to make himself king. There's the old myth that the seven kings of Rome, and then the last one was, uh, what is it, Tarquin Superbus or something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> and there's like the rape of Lucretia. They end the whole king thing and then switch to being a senate. And The senate. The senate. <laughs> <laughs> Spins around, pulls out his tiny little dagger. <laughs> Uh, yes. 
good stuff. Stabs Brutus. <laughs> Stabs Cato. <laughs> Just him and Mark Antony yeah. having a fight. Pompey is Count Dooku. <laughs> <laughs> good. good. Tells that Egyptian guy, kill him. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to it so basically because of that Brutus has a change of heart and he warns Caesar of the plot to kill him and mm-hmm. um, towards the end at the end he comes back to his house and there's Mark Antony and he's got like a gleaming sword and he's just facing him and he goes I came to bury you <laughs> which is the line comes from the line I came to bury Caesar not to praise him which is from that friend's Roman countryman speech from Julius Caesar yeah. or by Shakespeare yeah, you yeah. know when they would make that play back in the day, they would wear the regular clothes of the time. Really? Yeah, huh. 1500, 1600s British clothes, <laughs> which makes it even funnier. You know, big the, poofy pants. <laughs> the the uh, like the Royal Shakespeare Company. They did a version of Othello a couple years ago because the whole the whole thing is set in Cyprus, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it's like a modern day thing. It's still set in Cyprus, but they're all wearing like you know like BDUs and stuff, and it's like in an there's like office chairs and computers and stuff, but it's really ridiculous because part of the plot is that. They can't communicate quickly between each other. <laughs> so just pick up a damn phone. And call. Yeah, yeah, send an email. What the hell was that thing about the handkerchief? You know. Oh, Iago. Which, by the way, it's like with the like a handkerchief. <laughs> oh no! This guy has my girlfriend's handkerchief. I better kill her. <laughs> it's like it doesn't really work in the modern day. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but the funny thing, but it's a good story. This one. Yeah. But the funny thing is that. This ties us back to something that we need to cover, which is the cover of this book. Yes. When I, when I, on the cover of this book, it's a Roman legionnaire, Roman centurion or whatever in a tank. In a Panzer Mark IV. Yeah. <laughs> and the tank's got like a, like an eagle on the side, like a Roman eagle. And he has a pair of binoculars and he's wearing the big classic Roman helmet with Roman armor. And he's got a sword. <laughs> And I kept thinking, reading these short stories, when is the Roman tanks going to show up? What's going on? And it never shows up. It's not in the damn book. And I'll read the back for you. How about this? On top of it. Leadership makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. At Gogamela, the Macedonians had Alexander and the Persians had Darius. Result, world conquest. But what if the Persians had Erwin Rommel? What if? (laughs) Or what if George S. Patton had commanded Southern forces at Bull Run and Lincoln had become a Confederate prisoner? The possibilities are endless. Endless. Dot, dot, dot. See, that is completely misleading because there are no stories in this that even approximate <laughs> that. I guess the possibilities really are endless. <laughs> <laughs> you can put anything you want on the back of your book. Yeah, it's completely misleading because there's no stories even close to that. So I think the Republic for which it stands could have been made better if this tank made an appearance in it. Yeah, Mark Antony's like, I came here to bury you. <laughs> Panzer Vor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, gunner load. Armored piercing. 800 cubits. Fire on the way. <laughs> <laughs> like drives through his house, like in that German propaganda movie where that tiger drives through the house. Yeah. Enemy, 900 cubits. <laughs> Willie <laughs> Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Who says we can't write this stuff, Max? Yeah, that would be a... I'm not going to say it's a better story, but... <laughs> more entertaining. More I mean, entertaining, yeah. like, I came to crush you. I came to bury you under the treads of my tank. <laughs> 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 Uh, Calpurnia is in this story Caesar's wife Mm -hmm. Also the name of the maid in To Kill a Mockingbird That's right Yeah Mm. Yeah. I took Latin when I was a kid Mm -hmm. And didn't you You I did too I did too I also took Chinese at one point Different years but Different years But united by languages Yeah English Latin (laughs) Latin In Chinese Chinese yeah (laughs) Uh. (laughs) Oh goodness What's next uh, the Charge of Lee's Brigade oh, by, this one. by our guy, our guy, s and Sterling. <laughs> He's here too. Yeah. All the stars are in this compilation. Holy moly. Yeah. Um, so, so this is the Charge of the Light Brigade, but a little different. Mm-hmm. Things are modified somewhat. 
First mm-hmm. off, Robert E. Lee <laughs> is at the Charge of the Light Brigade. Mm-hmm. Um, so for those who don't know, like the Charge of the Light Brigade happened during the Crimean War, mm-hmm. which is a war that most people don't know anything about. And to be perfectly honest, I'm a little fuzzy on it as well. Yeah. Sevastopol. Sevastopol. Yes, yes. It was yeah. against the, the Turks. The tur- well, the Turks... The Turks and the Russians were fighting, and then the British and the French and other people joined on the side of the Turks. Right, okay. To fight in the Crimea. Mm-hmm. Um, and the war was pretty much there, just in the Crimea. Yeah. That's know? where we get balaclava from. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And that's where we get cardigans from as well. Yeah, Lord Cardigan. Yeah. yeah. I think there's another article of clothing we got from that war, but I can't remember precisely what it is. It was like oh. some trivia things, like oh, three articles mm-hmm. of clothing were named yeah. for yeah, yeah. But basically, during the Crimean... why did it say yum for balaclava? <laughs> I'm thinking of that 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 pastry, that Greek pastry, not balaclava. <laughs> bear claw, bear claw. What are you no, talking no, about? Something. No. Balaclava, whatever. Baklava, baklava. That's what baklava. I'm thinking of, uh, yum. I do like baklava, <laughs> but not a balaclava. Is that part in Aladdin where uh, genie is singing about baklava? Nice. And a little bit of baklava. Nice. Well, in this one, so yeah, Lee, so the mm. point is this is that Lee is there not because the, Amer- um, the United States is involved, the USA is involved in the Crimean War, but because the War of Independence failed. The American Revolution failed. Yes. And the United States is part of this British super empire. <laughs> uh, queen Victoria is, we wrote it out, the Queen of Great Britain, the Queen of France, Empress of North America. Empress of India and the further East Indies, Sultana Protectress of the Ottomans, Empress of Japan, and soon to be, is what they say, Empress of China and of Persia. Holy crap. All of China, eh? Ah. S.M. Sterling really likes blobbing up China. Yeah. <laughs> with the well, drakas. He likes blobbing up lots of things. <laughs> mega countries. He's a big fan of mega countries. He loves that stuff. I read the Black... Well, I, I'm almost done with the Black Chamber, and America does that in, as well. They like take all of Mexico and yay, they cannot be stopped. <laughs> yay, know? and America from the Arctic Ocean to Panama. I think I think the Philippines is a state in that also. Yeah, he's got a big thing for that too because the Dodraca America is literally Canada, the United States, Mexico, all of Central America down to Colombia, all of the islands including Cuba and all that in the mm. in the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico in the Caribbean, and then the Philippines and Hawaii. Holy crap, that's a big country. That's a big country. It's a little literal continent. Yeah. Well, I think this is his biggest blob yet, really. Yeah. Because Ooh. it's ridiculous. Empress of Japan? Of Japan. Ah, what descended is- from Amaterasu. <laughs> Queen Victoria. The sun goddess herself? Yeah. What a coincidence. <laughs> because the Battenberg family... Uh, <laughs> or, or, wait, is she Hanover. the Battenbergs? She's part of the House of Hanover. Okay, okay. Really? Right. Sort of. House of Hanover, Sax, House of Saxe Coburg, Gotha, somewhere in there. And her husband's also German, right? Prince well, Albert, Albert was from Germany. Did he have an accent? I think he did. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> that you're monarch. Well, I mean, most British kings for a long time came from other places or had parents from other places. Mm. I mean, George I, who was the elector of Hanover, didn't like speak English at all, barely. <laughs> George II spoke some English, but probably spoke more French than English. Mm. George III, I spoke English. I mean... I think it was Edward the first was the first was it Edward the third or Edward the first was the first British king to address Parliament in English, but it was Henry the fourth who was like the first king to regularly converse in English rather than French. French. Like if you went to like eleven sixty, you know, if you went to go see Henry the <laughs> second in your time machine, the king of England, he would have spoken French. Well, he wouldn't speak the French we speak today. Even the French we speak today, but he wouldn't have spoken English. Yeah. You know, that would have been something maybe they knew some of, but like to his courtiers and to his nobles, they spoke French because they really were French dukes. I mean, yeah. the Angevin Empire controlled more of France than it did of England. Mm. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting the thing. The Angevin holdings, about. Normandy, the Vendee, down into Gas, what's Gascony and Aquitaine. Like, mm. I mean, and that's why the French kings thought the British kings were below them, because Normandy, the Duke of Normandy, is a mere vassal of the King of France. <laughs> France. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. 
Plus, the English they spoke wasn't precisely the English we speak either. Oh, no, no, no. Well, like have you ever read Middle Eng- the English? Like the Canterbury Tales? Canterbury Tales, yeah. <laughs> Hurtus Fertab, you sounds a lot like the Swedish chef. My mom was an English major, so my mom like memorized part of the Canterbury Tales, and she can like cite cool. that stuff. Yeah. I, I can do it a little bit in Latin. The Aeneid, there's this part, Aeneas is talking to Queen Dido, and they made us memorize it. It's like, Can tique ram nes in denti corat ne bant in de toro paterae asic os saboto in fandam regina jubes winoare dolorum. You know, that kind of stuff. I think we had to do that too. E rent ana e quae quipsa miseri mawidi. You know, in meter with like, they, they like take out certain letters to make it actually work in the meter and stuff. Hmm, it was fun. Fidem miam obligo, Mexico <laughs> kiwi tatio. You know? oh, 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 yes. So in this, in Lee's brigade is a North American brigade of cavalry. Mm-hmm. Cavalry, excuse me. They're all Virginians. Vir- in Maryland, Maryland and okay. they have the Charleston Dragoons. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, you mm-hmm. know, mostly Southern. And it ends up there. He's ordered to do the same thing the Light Brigade is supposed to do. But. He's actually a competent military <laughs> leader, and he, instead of going right through the damn valley, you know, the Valley of Death Road, the, is it the three, is it the 500? I think it's 500, yeah. The, uh, 500 from the famous poem. He goes on the side where it's not as easy to hit them, um, and he takes the heights, and he takes the, the guns. Yeah, and he um, holds the position until he can get relieved by a bunch of, hold I think. Hold until relieved. Hold until Like relieved. in uh, The Longest Day. Oh. Where the character keeps on saying, hold until relieved, hold until relieved. In St. Mary Glace or? Uh, no, at Pegasus Bridge. Pegasus Bridge. So that's supposed to be, is it Howard, Major Howard? Richard Todd plays a character, but the funny thing is Richard Todd actually was at that battle in that very place. He was a lieutenant under that guy. And so there's someone else who plays him. That's... He's playing his commander. <laughs> and then there's another guy who's playing him <laughs> in it. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I wonder how many times that's happened in films. Probably not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. It's probably not a whole lot. Huh. But yeah, there's a character who's like, that's Richard Todd is the character. But Richard Todd, the actual guy who was that character, is playing his commander instead. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. Huh. So, but yeah, also they talk about how there's Chinese sepoys. Yeah. S- besieging Vladivostok. <laughs> Yay. Because they're going after the Russians. Why? Not really explained, not really gone yeah, into. They're just going to add that to their collection, too. Yeah. And then... They talk about the the, the, the wars, the, the uh, Napoleonic Wars ended sooner, because he talks about how his father made a whole bunch of money in the sack of Paris in 1808, oh, that's when Wellington right. sacked Paris. Yeah, and they're, they're, still, uh, they're still touchy about the fact that she's Queen of France, technically. Mm-hmm. You know, well, that Victoria. was until 1820 or so, or something like that, the King of England also came to be claimed to be the King of France. Mm-hmm. They had the fleur de lis was actually on their on their coat of arms. Yeah, yeah, along with a unicorn. Yeah, for Scotland, a rampant unicorn. Yeah, unicorn for Scotland. Yeah. Well, you know, in Scotland, the current queen is not Queen Elizabeth II. She's Queen Elizabeth because Scotland never had a Queen Elizabeth the first. If you say oh Queen my. Elizabeth the second, they're like, we've never had a Queen Elizabeth before. <sighs> okay, I get it, Alex oh Salmon. God. Yeah, I get it. Okay, you know. And what if there's a James? If there's another James, it'll be James the third and James the fifth? Is that sixth the... or seventh, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Huh. Because they think he was James the sixth of Scotland and James the first of England. There's not going to be another James. There's not going to be another Charles. What's the next one going to be? Charles is going to probably take the name George the seventh, is what I've heard. Seventh. That's all uh, right. You don't have to. There's a lot of filler Georges in there. King Arthur the second. I want a <laughs> British <laughs> monarch to be like, I'm King Arthur the second. I'm uh, Alfred the second. <laughs> Like Why not? I mean, uh, yeah, okay. King Louis the Second. There was a King Louis of of England. Really? Yes, there was. I uh, good old Starkey. He told me that Louis one. Thoreau, King Louis the <laughs> Second, King Louis from the Jungle Book, yeah, the King orangutan. Louis. Yeah, also known as Christopher Walken. <laughs> I want to be like you. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know the queens was so close to India. <laughs> Oh, my God. But great story. I really love this story. Mm-hmm. Oh, also, there's no slavery anymore. Slavery's been the abolished. The Emancipation Act. Yeah, of 1833. Talks about, oh, oh, if there's something that S.M. Sterling loves more than two hot ladies getting it on, <laughs> it's um, steam engines. Yes, I forgot about because this. Because... <laughs> 
Because it talks about like a steam plow pulling something and it broke down. So we're just going to have to rely on horses. And I'm like, <gasps> steam engines? Where he have al- I read this before? He also talks about his steam <laughs> tractor that he's got on his family farm <laughs> back in Virginia. Um, yeah. You know, Virginia named after the fact that Queen Elizabeth was a virgin. Why not name it just Elizabetha is what I'm wondering. Elizabetha, yeah. Charleston is named after King Charles. Georgetown. Georgetown. Washington, D.C., you know. Washington. Washington. Some people pronounce it that. I don't think that's correct. That's not the way I'd pronounce that. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. There's Georgetowns all over the place, including... um, Georgetown, it's 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 a city on some island in the Caribbean. Yeah. There's also Georgia. 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 And then there's... Tbilisi. <laughs> Tbilisi. There's also Georgia Island, I think. It's near Antarctica. Maybe. Or maybe it's... No, it's not St. George Island. I think it's George, the Georgia Islands or Georgia Island, or something like mm-hmm. that. There's, yeah. a, there's an achievement in Hearts of Iron 4 where you have the three Georgias. Georgia in America, Georgia the country, and then Georgia Island. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> okay. It's a very difficult one to get. Huh. Interesting. Um, but yeah, this is a great story. And I, what I like about it is it's relatively short. It gets to the point. He weaves in... I tell you what, S.M. Sterling, we kind of make fun of him sometimes. Great world builder. Damn, he's a good oh, he's world builder. Awesome. He world knows. building. He really can world build. And that's really important in alternate history because like, we, that, it just flushes it out. It just makes it nicer. And, and he knows how to give little nuggets of fun for yeah. people who know a lot about history and know a lot about uh, these ethnic groups and stuff. Mm-hmm. I can tell he's really into that stuff. That's like, good. Like in the Dracos, they talked about like Sami people mm-hmm. and um, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of... Yeah, this is a great one. This is very enjoyable. It's a quick read. Great. Next. Our other guy, our other favorite author, Harry Turtledove. He's back. He is. The editor himself strikes back with the Phantom Tobolkin. Hmm. This is about Fyodor Tobolkin, and he was a front commander in World War II for the Russians, for the Soviets. He fought in the very southern part of the Eastern Front, and he was the one who led the charge to the Balkans in 44 and 45. But in this one... Him and Nikita Khrushchev are actually guerrilla fighters in a Nazi-occupied Ukraine in 1947. Yeah. So this is a world in which Leningrad and Moscow fall, and the purges went a little bit farther because he mentions how Zhukov was purged in 1936. Yeah, yeah. Like, I looked up all those names. Every single one of them was totally purged, except for Zhukov. Mm -hmm. Except for him. Mm -hmm. Because famously, he got sent to Mongolia. Mongolia. Ah. To deal with the Japanese, the whole Coke and Goal incident happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he was spared because of that. Yeah, no, this is a good one. This is really good. And this one, he's like a worker on a collective farm, and they're like, we formed the fourth Ukrainian front. Hmm. It's like an understrength regiment. This is a uh, this is an army, you know, this is sixteenth <laughs> army over here. And it's like a platoon of people. <laughs> which is great because that's totally what the Soviets give like really grandiose names to everything. They just pin tons of medals on you. That's right. They're like the fifth shock army and the third guards army. Yeah, and yeah. The, 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 fifth, ta- fifth guards tank army, finest fighting force on the Eastern Front. Hmm. So but they lead this raid on I'm going to mispronounce this. Zaporose? Zaporozhye. Zaporozhye? I think. Okay. Somehow, even though they're collective workers, they find a way to hide Pepe Shaw's and all sorts of other weapons, <laughs> and they just kill everyone they get in their hands on. Like at the beginning, they run into a German officer with like a prostitute, and they just shoot both of them, even <laughs> though she's Russian. They just... It's a cold boom, world. Boom. Traitors. <laughs> and they're raiding a German armory. Tobolkin's talking with Khrushchev, and they're like stuffing KR-98K magazines into all their pockets (laughs) and picking up machine guns and belts of MG-42 ammunition. It's interesting, like they end at the dogs are chasing them, and they spread peppered vodka on the ground to throw the dogs off their track, which is actually pretty smart. Does that work? That plus going through water. Yeah. Because that definitely will throw off a scent. They do that, so... It's this is a good one. They actually build up because at the beginning, the way it's worded is it sounds like they're about to launch an attack with an army on this <laughs> until like they like later on they actually describe the actual size of it. Yeah. So and it's like 1947. What's going on here? Wait. They have FW 190s though because they talk about some flying by and they all land to the ground. But I think the funniest thing about them is they still carry like Soviet banners into battle. <laughs> you know? That's, yeah. Yes! Uh. <laughs> I've got to hide this under the chicken coop when yeah, I get back to the collective farm. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting that they keep the collective farms, too, the Nazis. Yeah, yeah it's interesting, yeah. yeah. 
or that they wouldn't figure out someone like Tobolkin, who was clearly of some rank in the Soviet army before World War II. Mm. It's not like he just signed on in 41 and was a front commander by the end. Well, Khrushchev, too. Like, what the... Yeah, yeah. Like, why yeah. didn't they figure... They're probably using nom de guerres. Or, or, or like, like maybe the two of them are like the Forest Brothers, the Lithuanian Forest Brothers. Those two live in the forest, but everybody else has to get on the farm, so they sneak out at night or something. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. It's way, good, though. This is I a like really it. good story. Yeah. And it makes you kind of wonder, like, what what's even going on? Like, what's the world look like yeah, at yeah. this point? 47? Russian? Yeah. Because yeah. you get a very small view of the world. Like, what's mm-hmm. the rest of the world? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But sometimes that's okay. You know, you can kind of infer what else is there. But sometimes you want a narrow, cleanly focused story that right on what's happening. Mm. Ah, what's the, next? The next one, uh, The Last Crusader. I love Napoleon stories. I love Napoleon in general. And uh, I love Napoleonic history, and mm-hmm. this is some this is some good fun. In this, Napoleon, born in Corsica, not mm-hmm. really French, no. uh, more Italian. He really is Italian, pretty much. Kind of, yeah. Sort I mean, of. you know, it, it's, it's, I'm sure Corsican people would be like, <laughs> but um, but you're from but, Corsica. Let us know. <laughs> but you know, the fact that Napoleon even got to go to the artillery college, the military academy was kind of a fluke under normal circumstances he'd never be able to go and if circumstances were just slightly different something like this might have happened not really but i mean Mm -hmm. the fact that he would go on to become a priest Mm -hmm. this story is about napoleon the cardinal and there's all sorts of winks and nods to stuff all over the place this is a good one yeah yeah i liked it like they talk about they they so napoleon becomes a priest then he becomes a bishop and the, the pope appoints him as Bishop of Toulon, which is where the famous 13 of Vandermeer whiff of grape shot thing happens. Mm-hmm. But in this, it's different because he's like demonstrating power of cannons and he like fires off a shot that has nothing inside of it. And it's called the whiff of brimstone <laughs> incident. <laughs> nice. And he like gives this big speech and they make uh, flyers out of it and they distribute it mm. in the va day and it causes a giant uprising against the godless directory <laughs> those <laughs> bastards <laughs> like, they're better than the committee of public safety yeah yeah a lot less radical it's just so funny like the directory is such a weird little footnote nobody remembers it it was totally impotent and i mean it was around for just a little time there was a bunch of senators and they all wore special robes and stuff. Nobody remembers anything about them because they're totally nothing. Mm-hmm. They came into power in the Termidorian reaction when mm-hmm. people got fed up with Maximilian Robespierre. So, like, Robespierre knew the coup was happening and he locked himself in his room and they were like trying to beat the door down and he got out this pistol and he tried to shoot himself, but he accidentally just shot himself in the jaw instead. Oh, God. <laughs> and. But like the 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 coup guys broke into the room, picked him up, and then brought him to like trial. But they like put him on the table in the middle of the assembly hall and went through their session. <laughs> and then at the end of the session, they guillotined him. But he's like just sitting there with a huge hole in his jaw, just like oh god, oh <laughs> jeez. Do they still have metric time, the 10-day week? Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe, yeah, because I don't think that got abolished until Napoleon took over. So. Mm-hmm. Metric time. It's so stupid. As, uh, as uh, Peter Hitchens calls it, he said it's peasant counting toe math or something like that. Is he not a fan of the metric system? No, he doesn't. No, he yeah. doesn't like... He's so, like, we have perfectly good measurements. Pounds and imperial gallons and all that. The king's foot. The king's foot. Yeah. Peppercorns. Peppercorns. Hogsheads. Hogsheads. Stone. Something I'll never be able to figure out. It's uh, too much math. Was it 13 pounds each, something like that? I think that? it's 14, uh, 12 maybe? Oh, Who can no. say? Yeah. Woof. So, but, but in this one, it's like basically at Waterloo, he's leading them all on. And yeah, there's like all the generals are in one room and he's like haranguing them, giving them a classic Napoleon speech. And at the end of it, he walks over to Blucher and he's like, here, we'll attack here. Onward, onward to Catrabra. <laughs> And then, yeah, no, and then Blucher's like, forwards, <laughs> uh, forwards, forwards to Quattro Bra. It's, yeah. it's actually a really short story, too. Yeah, it's, you know, it gets it's, its, it gets its punchline in at the end. It's mm-hmm. fun. That was nice. But, you know, it really makes me wonder, though, Matt, mm-hmm. what if 
What if Consul Rebecca had obeyed Wellington's order of 7 p.m. 15 June 1815 and abandoned Quatre Bras? <laughs> what if that happens, you know? I don't know. Why don't we ask? <laughs> I might have to read a different short story compilation to get that answer. Uh, okay. But all the Napoleonic generals like Ney, Davu, and all that, they're still French generals. And they seem to do pretty much the same thing Napoleon has done. Mm -hmm. Not an invasion of Russia, though, but they talk about Austerlitz and all that. So. Yeah, yeah. Really One wonders if without the force of personality that Napoleon had, would this have happened? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun story, but if you really think about it more, it's a little unclear how the hell this could even happen. Yes. So here's an interesting one, the next story. It's An Old Man's Summer by Esther Friesner about Dwight Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. So in this story, Dwight Eisenhower has been laid low by a stroke. Mm -hmm. He was president, and he had a stroke, and he was partially paralyzed. There was a period of time, and then he had a second stroke, which completely paralyzed him. Mm -hmm. And he's bound to a wheelchair, and he's been transferred to Gettysburg. Well, he did own a home in Gettysburg. It's right near the National Park. You can go to the Eisenhower National Home. Nice. That's where nice. he died, I'm pretty sure. Really? I think so. Mm -hmm. But he's, uh, he's confined to his wheelchair. He's being waited on by nurses. And he kind of goes through a phantasmagorical adventure. Because <laughs> he starts reminiscing about his past. And he's feeling very guilty about all the lives that were lost in World War II. And he actually kind of astral projects himself <laughs> yes me and the boys used to go astrally projecting oh no. best lock up ever lock up <laughs> it's a fine television show um <laughs> wherein someone talks about how they astrally project it's great it's i highly recommend that television show but yeah. in this he, he kind of astrally projects himself into the battle of gettysburg so he's walking around in his bathrobe and slippers <laughs> for all these Rifles are being shot, and he actually talks to a couple figures from history. He encounters General Meade. <laughs> Yay. He's an interesting-looking guy, kind of like Henry Halleck, you know. Yeah, he is an interesting-looking guy. They, they talk about like how— Like a snapping turtle is what they said at the time. <laughs> In the story, they, they talk about his sad eyes, mm -hmm. and he's got very, very sad-looking eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the two of them talk for a little while. They don't really say much. Uh, of importance and then he goes to arlington national cemetery he looks at the graves there of all the people that died in d-day i think you were saying that like it's kind of implied yeah i think it's implied that d-day was a failure but again this one is a good it's an interesting story but like it suffers from the you need to make the diversions clear enough like mm. something like charge of lee's brigade does a great job it doesn't it's not like here's the divergence at the very beginning but like it's clear once you're reading what the divergence is and this one you really have to suss it out and and, and just show it to me. <laughs> just tell it to me. <laughs> like, uh, like, uh, if D Day failed, why is Eisenhower president? Yeah, I know. You know, exactly. It was all Monty's fault. <laughs> exactly. Blame, blame Patton. It was all Bradley's fault. Yeah. All Omar. It was all Freddie DeGangun's fault. It was Charles Portal, Peter Portal. It was. It was all <laughs> Earl, was the all Earl of Tudis's fault. <laughs> Earl Alexander. It was all Theodore Roosevelt Jr.'s fault. That's right. Uh, it's all Tom Hanks's fault. But yeah, he goes to Arlington and he encounters the ghost of Robert E. Lee, which it makes sense because that's where Robert E. Lee's house is, is yes. Arlington National Cemetery. That's right. Mm -hmm. Great view. Have you been there? I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've never been there before. And I've seen the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and Aud Audie Murphy's grave and... So, uh, so, so you know, it's 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 actually a pretty good mm -hmm. story. It's very well written. Mm -hmm. uh, Eisenhower meets his kid that died at a very young age of yeah. scarlet Ike, fever. Icky, 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 I C K Y, which is spelled a lot like Icky, but maybe is it Icky? Could be Icky. I mean, he's Ike, so Icky. <laughs> I don't. It's a weird thing to call your kid Icky. Icky, yeah. But, it, you know, it's kind of sweet. And at mm -hmm. the end, he at least regains the ability to speak mm -hmm. because his nurse walks in and he's like, hey, how's it going? Ha ha. Hey. Ha ha. He gives him that trademark big yeah. Eisenhower smile. Yeah. I like Ike. I, yeah, I like Ike, too. I like Adlai. I, <laughs> screw you. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. Eh. Eisenhower was the first person my grandfather voted for. Ah. Yeah. 
He was the first person I voted for, too. <gasps> oh, right. Well, you know, the first person I ever voted for... Was for Roosevelt. Was for Benjamin Harrison, yeah, actually. That's right. Um, <laughs> uh, so what I'm wondering about... So, okay, the president's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. The president can't speak. Mm -hmm. Have they invoked the 25th Amendment? Yeah. Like, this Probably. is this is this our... This is post-25th Amendment, because it came when Truman was president. Wait, really? Mm -hmm. I thought the 25th Amendment happened right after Woodrow Wilson. No. Mm -hmm. Really? No, not until not until after Truman, because the 25th Amendment not only has the set up the, 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 the order of succession, but also is what limits presidents to two terms, hmm. because it wasn't until after... Roosevelt, where they're like, ah, I probably shouldn't have someone with more than two terms. That's really interesting. I had no idea. Although there is a way to serve more than eight years as president. And that's non-consecutive. No, no. Actually, it's not non-consecutive because it's still non-consecutive would count. You can't do one term, take one off, and then do more. <laughs> no. And there's only one person. I'm trying to think. There's only one person in the post-25th Amendment era who had done this, which is if you are vice president mm -hmm. and it is more than halfway through the president's term and you succeed them, you can be elected twice more. So like Lyndon Johnson... He ran in 64, but he also could have run in 68. Hmm. So he could have been, you can technically, the longest you could technically be president is nine years and 364 days. So let's say you were vice president and the president you were serving under died after a year in office. You can only run for one more term. Hmm. But if they died at three years in, you could finish out their term and run twice more. So actually you can be president for nine years and 364 days. Huh. You can be longer than eight years. Yeah. Well, wait a second. What if you do that and then you become the vice president for the next president and then that president dies? I don't think you can do that. They're just gonna. They're just gonna. <laughs> Why would you do that? What it was sort of. What sort of. Uh, brought, what was the guy in Russia did that where he was Medvedev? Me, yes. where he, was, he was vice. He was prime minister. Then he was president. Then he was prime minister again. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. No. It Interesting. Work. Why would they do that? Eternal vice president. No. Uh -huh. So, like, what would happen? Would the what, what is it? The Speaker of the House becomes president after the vice president? Yeah. So the succession is, yeah, it goes president, vice president, Speaker of the House, president pro temp of the Senate. And then it starts going into the secretaries, the cabinet secretaries based on when the cabinet secretary was created. So secretary of state's pretty close. Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, not so close. Not so close. Yeah. <laughs> like when the secretary of the interior is higher up than you are. That's a bad sign. Yeah. Um, What's next? Ah. Your favorite. My favorite. Billy Mitchell's Overt Act. What I like about this is the way it's written. It's written in like excerpt form. It's like excerpts from newspapers, excerpts from books, excerpts from even a, a song at one point. Yeah. Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie. Smoke on the water. Smoke on the water. Billy in the sea. <laughs> Billy in the sea. <laughs> so the point of this one is Billy Mitchell, right before he's supposed to be court-martialed, gets in a plane crash and he's severely injured and he recovers but because of it he never gets court martialed he sort of sits around for 15 years reading up on japan the 47 ronin yeah exactly he becomes sort of like a he he changes his old approach his confrontational approach and becomes a company man hmm. basically he's never really changed but he goes around and they say he's like got all these different like minor postings and then <laughs> finally he becomes the leader of a b-17 bomber wing in pearl harbor in 1941 and Long story short, he anticipates the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he's running these, these. He's having his men, you know, watch out for uh, these carriers, and they find them. And on December the sixth, he tells husband Kimmel and everyone else, Walter Short, like, you got to do, we got to do something about this. And they're like, ah, oh, you're just crazy. So he decides he's going to launch an attack, a preemptive strike on the carriers himself, and they cause a huge, a whole bunch of damage. Mm -hmm. They sink one carrier. They sink the Akagi. They damage the... Soryu. Soryu. One of them plows into another ship and damages its bow. And then at the very end, as the <laughs> attack, as they've launched their attack run, Billy Mitchell's B-17 turns around and launches a kamikaze attack on the Kaga <laughs> and hits it and blows it up. <laughs> so, and then, then like the Lexington comes and attacks and they cause, I think it's four of the six carriers are sunk and the other mm -hmm. two are severely damaged. So the combined, you mean the six carriers that are the heart of the Japanese fleet are basically lost for all intents and purposes at the very beginning of the war. Yeah, it's crazy. And what's interesting about this is that it's really interesting to have the different parts of it. And there's even an alternate version of the Day of Infamy speech. And it's like, <laughs> Japan attempted to attack us on December the 6th. But due to Billy Mitchell's heroics has stopped this. But long story short is that that changes the Pacific War. Because the U.S. wasn't successfully attacked, People still think the Japanese are like buffoons, mm -hmm. even they don't take them seriously. Yeah. And the American public isn't roused behind the act itself. 
And so you have like sort of like the Vietnam War protests going on and the U.S. never really reunites in the war against Japan. And some mistakes are made. They have an interview with Harry Truman in it. And he talks about how that prancing tin horn MacArthur <laughs> gets himself trapped in the Philippines. Which I want to read that. <laughs> help <laughs> please um yeah it's uh but it's interesting to see like he's like we lost more ships trying to rescue macarthur than we had at pearl harbor on that day you know mm. if we just let him attack we would have whipped him and gone and sunk those carriers and then everyone would have been behind the mm. behind the war effort the u.s sues for peace with japan as the soviets are building on their front and eventually all of east asia becomes communist mm. and you have richard nixon standing up in congress and saying the u.s has no interest in anything west of hawaii <laughs> and, not one american soldier is worth anything in southeast asia yeah well i know you had some interesting points about this when we were talking about it beforehand that you noted down well one thing is that they make a separate peace with the japanese and at first i was thinking like oh wait a second no separate pieces that's that's the agreement but no casablanca conference hasn't happened yet so it's like is the u.s even involved in europe like mm -hmm. i don't know what's going on there um mm -hmm. And I, I, I really like seeing an alternate history story wherein it's the classic alternate history short story ending, like the whole sinking the battleship and all that stuff and the day of infamy, but then just keep going and expanding history more after mm -hmm. this crazy event and everything's kind of twisted and mm -hmm. almost like parody of real history. Yeah. Well, I like too that it shows that it's a perfect example of the old saying, you can win a battle and lose a war. Yeah. And the whole point is, is like, just because the U.S. does better at Pearl Harbor in some ways, like Billy Mitchell has done the U.S. a disservice. Right. Like, because his whole thing was about how planes could sink ships and the air power. And he shows, yeah, air power is great. But, like, you can win now and be worse in the long run. Because of this, the U.S. is in a worse position at the end of the war than it was before. As weird as you may think, well, what if we sank the whole attack fleet on Pearl Harbor? Man, that'd be awesome. Well, not really. That I, takes some really serious thinking, and that's great on the author's part. Well, I don't know, though, because, I mean, that really screws up the invasions of the Philippines. Malaya. It, it tips off the, the British. Dutch East Indies. Yeah. You, know, maybe, you know, maybe Singapore doesn't fall the same way it does, you know. Like, everyone's got a day's warning ahead of time, more yeah. or less. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know. I'm a little unconvinced by the fact that it's a huge quagmire as a result of having a nice victory. But I like the idea. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of it I mean, a lot. Well, I mean, obviously, it doesn't necessarily mean something like that would have happened. But it is interesting to point out that such a thing is not always going to be a, a rounding success. Yeah. And also, the author does a great job of capturing like the nature of certain people like MacArthur. Because there's like an excerpt <laughs> from MacArthur. And he's like, Billy Mitchell is my old and dear friend. It's like, not really. <laughs> you court-martialed his ass yeah, yeah, in our in timeline. This, yeah, in our timeline, yeah. Yeah. Prancing tin horn. I, I still don't really understand why Billy Mitchell got court martialed. Because he was questioning army doctrine at the time and they didn't like that. And that's it? That's mm -hmm. all? Yeah, and he was being insubordinate to a degree. Okay, okay all right. Did he do anything in World War II or was he totally out of the. He died in like 1936. Oh. Because they mentioned that it has like an unpublished, something from an unpublished memoir by his wife. And it said if he hadn't been in that crash and he stayed in the service, they would have kicked him out and he would have died of a broken heart. Mm -hmm. So he lives, you know, longer. It's a really good story. I like this a ton because it's it's a plausible divergence. And people act like they did. They were just as stubborn husband Kimmel and Walter Short as they were in real life about these sorts of things. It's like Walter Short's like, well, I had all the aircraft chained up because, you know, saboteurs. And it's like, did any saboteurs ever attempt anything? Well, no, but that just shows how effective my measures were. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's actually very well written. I like the different excerpts. That's cool because it gives a different tenor yeah. to like, you're telling the story. And it, it takes skill for a writer to like, construct that because it'd be yeah. way easier to just tell a linear story than to have like a lot of sloth farrago is like mentioned to have written one of the things and he was the guy who wrote Patton, like the oh, book, really pat the book that Patton's based off a lot of sloth farrago yeah huh. farrago i think the longest no the longest day was cornelius ryan and bridge too far as cornelius right now a lot of sloth farrago wrote the book about Patton that became the basis of the movie Patton hmm. and made george c scott <laughs> george c scott is now Patton, pretty much um yeah. Uh, yeah, because like as an author, you have to write in the voice of all these different types of people. Yeah. And, you know, that's good. That's, 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 and it shows how powerful the B-17 is. Really great weapon. It's really good. Flying just, fortress. Just ask our boy Doolittle how good a B-17 is. Yeah. They, they launched them off a carrier. Right? They did, didn't they? No, those are B twenty five. Those are B twenty five. Mitchell's. Ah, oh, damn it! Twin engine bomber, not oh four my engines. God. You could not 
launch a B-17 off a carrier. Not a carrier of that time, you couldn't. What about today? The uh, I know, they're still pretty damn big. They're pretty big, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, not a B-29, definitely. No. Mm-hmm. B-52. <laughs> just, the con- just, like, take the cotton tower out as you can <laughs> <laughs> well, given their given their range these days with with um with uh, uh, air to air refueling, you don't need to launch them from a carrier. Yeah, and with the amount of American air bases, they launched the an airstrike from Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, on Iraq, and they flew the B set fifty twos back. The longest uh, airstrike ever. Is this uh, in the first Gulf War? In the first 91. Gulf War. Yeah, from Barksdale Air Force Base in the middle of Louisiana yeah. to Iraq. And they never stopped flying because of in, yeah, air, air refueling. Now they can take off from Djibouti. Yeah. Or um, they use uh, uh, Diego Garcia. Is that what is it? Diego Garcia in, uh, it got me. in, in the Indian Ocean. Okay. They're, out of, they're out of Guam. In the Indian? Oh, it's an it's a mm-hmm. aircraft carrier. It's like, well, it's not an aircraft carrier. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a base that the U.S. has leased that they can launch. In the Seychelles? It, no, it's not in the Seychelles. It's in somewhere in the middle of the Indian Ocean. But Diego Garcia, they can stage the B-52s out of there bizarre that's really interesting mm-hmm. huh they can go out of england they could go out of probably germany they can go out of guam mm-hmm. hawaii mm-hmm. but with inner with air to air refueling you can just keep them going just keep on going keep on keeping on keep baby. on rolling baby uh as they say you but... know what time it is <laughs> no but they also talk about how b18 bolos which are like dc3s <laughs> they just they, get they, immediately they, they, killed. They just they, they get sent to attack and they just get wiped out the like zeros <laughs> to shoot down all of them <laughs> um but um great good story really good story i like it a lot yeah. and the ending is good because it's like well not good but it just points out like just because you win now doesn't mean it's going to be better later and Truman is just hilarious in it. He just yeah. hates everyone. MacArthur, <laughs> Mitchell, everyone. Well, you know, he he's, you know, he loses. So, yeah, you know, of course he's bitter. Senator Truman. Senator president. Truman. Oh, that's right. He never becomes president because Thomas. our guy, Mr. Dewey. Yeah. Yeah. Do the Dewey. Dewey the Dewey. Yes. Mountain Dewey <laughs> is president in 1944 because, <laughs> which really, you know. Dr. Dewey. <laughs> the war. Diet Dr. Dewey. <laughs> So, like, why would... I don't know. It's a little silly to knock FDR out of office in 1944. Like, Well, if he wasn't doing a great job. No. And his health. Yeah. If he's yeah. more stressed out, maybe he just mm-hmm. is on hanging by a thread. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. This is a good one. Yeah. Next, we have A Hard Day for Mother. Unfortunately, I did not read this one, so I'm going to rely on you yes. to tell me. Long story short, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain goes and teaches at VMI, which is a new military institute instead of Bowdoin College. He becomes friends with one Thomas Jonathan Jackson, also known as Stonewall Jackson, uh, and they become like best buddies forever. So, and, so here's something about that. Yeah. It's the fact that Stonewall Jackson, as a teacher, I know for a fact, was not very well liked as a teacher. <laughs> yeah, they called him Tom Fool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, burn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, because he was like... You know, I don't like the retrospective diagnosis thing, but like a diagnosis of like some sort of autism spectrum would probably not be too different or he was at least a very weird and quirky guy he would yeah. hold his hand up to let the blood drain out he didn't eat pepper because he thought it made one of his legs weak yeah. and he was kind of a religious fanatic hmm. uh but in this one him tom fool jackson and yankee josh chamberlain that's actually what they refer to him into it <laughs> become josh. become chamberlain becomes like his <laughs> chief of staff and he actually helps after J- this happens at gettysburg so basically if you've seen the movie gettysburg with little round top just have uh c thomas howell's character tom chamberlain become head of the union troops and then the head of the confederate troops is joshua lawrence chamberlain but he attacks with like his whole brigade against them instead of just one division he countermands orders and he defeats the union and they roll up the whole line and gettysburg's a huge victory for the confederates interesting and he even confronts his brother and his brother's holding a gun at his face and in the movie gettysburg he tells him to step away, his brother to step away because there's shells exploding. He said, if one comes too close, you don't want it to be too close or else it'll be a hard day for mother. And in this one, his uh, brother points like a gun right in his face and he's like, please, Tom, don't do it. It'll be a hard day for mother. You know? <laughs> but long story short, the Confederates win at Gettysburg and then they go on and it's referenced at the end that Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain becomes president of the Confederacy. Um, the U.S. eventually reunites in the early 1900s. But Washington, D.C. was captured by the Confederates on July the 8th of 1863. Which is interesting because the defenses of Washington, D.C. were strong. Hmm. Real strong. 
so they have they have what called heavy artillery regiments that were later used in Grant's push in the Hundred Days as basically cannon fodder manned the city. There were still troops there, and they had big guns and big fortifications. So I have a problem with them winning over that. But long story short, is it's somewhat of a I guess I guess a believable divergence. People who were born in the North did fight for the South. People born in the South did fight for the North. Mm. It's an interesting story, um, but he's smarter. Like he won't attack until they get water for the troops because it's really hot out, and his, his his superiors are like, "You need to attack, attack!" And he like delays until they get canteens for the men to help refresh them, and he just fights the battle smarter from the Confederate perspective. Hmm. It's a really good story, and it made me think that Jeff Daniels <laughs> is plays Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain in the movie Gettysburg, and then was in the movie Dumb and Dumber. Yes, yes. And Dumb and Dumber too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I half expected that to be the end of it. That he gets to the top and there's Jim Carrey. And it's Dumb and Dumber too. <laughs> it's going to be a hard day for Mother. Yeah, it's going to be a hard Jim. day for Mother to watch this movie. Uh, also, Gods and Generals, he's in that too. It's a much older and fatter man. Yeah, even though it supposedly happens before Gettysburg. Um, so, what is it? Gettysburg is to Dumb and Dumber is Gods and Generals is to Dumb and Dumber, Dumb and Dumber too. too. Not even Dumb and Dumber, -er, which you're not even going to touch that one. <laughs> not with a 20 foot pole. No, that's like um, the, the full last measure. Or the oh, last the last measure. full measure. Yeah, they never yeah. made it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Oh, gods and generals. One last tidbit about Stonewall Jackson. Mm -hmm. When he was a teacher, mm -hmm. he uh, would recite lectures from memory. Mm -hmm. And students would like raise their hands and would say, uh, Professor Jackson, could you please explain this one thing? Because it wasn't very clear. And then he would just rewind the lecture to the relevant portion and just verbatim <laughs> state it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a... What a guy. <laughs> please. <laughs> if you want to read a good book about it, I just finished it not that long ago. The Class of 46 or Class of 1846, which is the story of the West Point Class of 1846, which he was in, George McClellan was in, and a lot of other famous and some other famous generals from the time in the Civil War we're in. And it talks about him as kind of a weirdo, which mm -hmm. he totally was. Yeah. A very good general. But he had he was very inconsistent because he'd like get on weird he didn't like to fight on Sundays. Hmm. You know, because it's the Lord's Day. Because he was like really religious. And they're like, well, it's war. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> bud. Um, yeah. um at times, like when he was executing his own battle plans, he was excellent. But he really did not was not as funny as Lee said, you know, when he his arm was amputated you may have lost my your left arm but i've lost my right well he actually wasn't that great a subordinate at times because when he'd get direct orders like during the peninsula campaign he really screwed him up <laughs> big time huh. um strange man and he also treated his subordinates like crap like ab ap hill the hero at the very end of the battle of antietam was technically under arrest at that time because jackson had <laughs> arrested him for something that he'd done yeah, he was kind of a strange, awkward-looking guy. He always stood ramrod straight when he was in a chair because he thought if he slouched, his organs would come out of alignment. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. Then he had a cousin who, prior to the war, had been a lieutenant governor of Virginia, William Jackson, a.k.a. Mudwall Jackson. Mud <laughs> <laughs> what a great name. Mudwall Jackson. <laughs> there he stands like a mud wall. <laughs> Well, actually, the whole Stonewall thing is probably was an insult from General Bernard B., who shows up in Gods and Generals and gets killed. That whole, there he stands Jackson like a stone wall was probably not like, look at how proud. There he stands like a stone wall. Like, there that idiot stands like a stone wall. <laughs> he's Move! Supposed, he's supposed to be moving. <laughs> yeah. Attack, yeah. for God's sake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there he stands like a mud wall. I love that. That's a great nickname. Oh, man, that's depressing. <laughs> oh, God. No, it was good. It's Civil War, fascinating era, that's for sure. Well, uh, moving from the Civil War mm -hmm. to the birth of America, mm -hmm. uh, the next story is The Captain from Kirk Bean by David Weber. Mm -hmm. I didn't know John Paul Jones wasn't from America. He's Scottish. Huh. And this one, he's just Sir John Paul. John Paul, yeah. And it took me a while to realize who this guy was supposed to be. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, John Paul Jones in this fights for the British instead of the Americans. Mm -hmm. And he's at the... Uh, Battle, Battle of the Chesapeake. Yeah, precisely, yeah. He defeats the French. And Battle of Chesapeake was a huge part of the Siege of Yorktown because it closed off reinforcement to Cornwallis. Cornwallis. No choice but to surrender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's confusing when you see that painting because you see the American flag and you see a white flag and then Cornwallis is in the middle 
but the white mm-hmm. flag, those guys are French because mm-hmm. that's the that's the royal the like, royal French flag. yeah the royal French flag at the time. Yeah. So when I saw that as a kid, I thought that that was the British surrendering, but no, no, that's that's not what's going on in this painting. Yeah, um, that's where they played the world turned upside down. Oh yeah, what the British played when they surrendered. Yeah, yeah. They, it, Harry Turtledove mentions that in a book. I can't mm-hmm. remember which one it is. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, a neat story. I like David mm-hmm. Weber. It's a very, it's another boat story. Uh, Boats. <laughs> boat stories are, are they're, they're a genre unto themselves. Yeah, the and, HMS Bodie McBoatface, <laughs> gone down with all hands. I, you know, I like the grape shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, canister, uh Chain shot. Chain shot, yes. Um, but, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. It was another one of those stories where most people would not know any kind of divergence because most people don't know about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And honestly, I had to look up a few things myself. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But at the end of the story, it's a huge victory for the British. And it kind of ends there. I guess mm-hmm. the implication is maybe the Revolutionary War continues for longer. But mm-hmm. ultimately... Even the point of view character says, like, this is kind of a fool's hair and this is going to we're not going to be able to hold on to the colonies at this point. You know, when yeah, well, at that point, they really couldn't have because, yeah. it's you know, they're going to keep fighting a war. Yeah. Like open that. rebellion. Too many people are going to get huge, hanged. Yeah. Huge chunk of the country is under the control of your rebels. The rebels. Yeah. The rebel alliance. Rebels. You know, the British never lost control of New York the whole war. Well, no, they did, and then they won it back. New York oh, really? was, in 1776, prior to the Trenton campaign, uh, they took New York and actually almost captured Washington to flee from the Brooklyn Heights and all that. Very interesting. Huh. But it remained a, a British stronghold until after, yeah, in their hands. I had no idea. Oh, yes. I don't know very much about Revolutionary War history. I know less about it, because you think of, like, Saratoga and, like, uh, Lexington and Concord and Trenton and... Because yeah. they're victories. Well, and then victory, that, uh, you know, Mel Gibson running around like a crazy man in South Carolina and the Throwing Patriot axes. Yeah, people. Yeah. And then, uh, and then you know, yeah. Yorktown, but all that other stuff. And the Marquis de Lafayette. Almost said the Marquis de Sade, not that one, the other no. Marquis. <laughs> An American hero, the Marquis de Sade. <laughs> yeah. Whip them. Whip them into the sea. No. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, part of Tallahassee, Florida was bequeathed to. Lafayette, and that's why there's a section of that city called Frenchtown. Interesting. That was Lafayette's... uh... Lafayette, we are here. Not said by Pershing, said by one of his commander's uh, subordinates. Is that upon... Coming coming... in 1917, you know, Mm. he went to Lafayette's tomb. Lafayette, we are here. Mm. Lafayette, a very big hero in America, but in France, uh, kind of a middling figure, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Pulaski, also a hero in America. Casimir Pulaski, yeah. yeah. Fort Pulaski in Fort, Savannah. Yeah, yeah. It was Poles. I love them. Good old, I like Poland a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, David Weber wrote this story, and uh, he also wrote a science fiction series called Honor Harrington about a lady who's just Horatio Hornblower. But Horatio Hornblower... And spurs <laughs> with lasers and stuff. Yay, yeah, lasers. But it's totally just, it's totally Horatio just. Horatio Hornblower. Um, yeah. Which, Horatio, know, blow your horn. Um, the guy who wrote Horatio Hornblower, C.S. Forrester, also wrote The African Queen, ah. which was then made into a movie directed by John Huston, starring Catherine Hepburn and uh, Humphrey Bogart. And it's one of my favorite movies. It's really great. Ah. I highly recommend seeing that film. Mm-hmm. But uh, this was a story you highly recommended me. It's I, next. I, when I picked up this book, I said, Matt, what are the must-read stories in this book? And I you gave said, you two, and we're about to get to them. Yeah, yeah. First one, Bloodstained Ground by Brian Thompson. More Custer, yes. Yay, more Custer. Hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> um, so Mark Twain is in it as Sam Clemens, and basically he's this washed-up, alcoholic newspaper reporter in new york because people really hated the adventures of huckleberry finn in this so they basically wanted to like lynch him is what it sounds like kind of like how few remain where he's a reporter in that too i know well he was a reporter before he got into the writing real writing business but Mm -hmm. in this the battle of the little bighorn custer wins and he becomes president because ulysses s grant tries to run for a third term yeah the giant mechanical spider thing did hurt him for sure (laughs) 
<laughs> the poll numbers. You've taken a terrible hit of the poll, Ulysses. James West. Damn it. <laughs> Uh, Artemis? Yes. Yeah, it's right. Um, so basically, Custer survives, and they send Mark Twain down to Washington, D.C., because Custer is at a reunion celebrating the battle when one of the Indian reenactors shoots him in the chest with an arrow and kills him. <laughs> so he goes down to his funeral to go see it, and he's in the train from New York there, and then this like dandy walks in. He's like, hi, I'm Audie Reed. I am the nephew of George Custer. Would you like to hear about the whole cover-up story that we did concerning it? <laughs> he's like, ah, yes, please, I would like to hear about that. <laughs> so he just goes on to tell basically what happens is, is Custer kicks Marcus Reno and Captain Benteen who are commanders of the other two parts of the 7th Cavalry, out. And he has his brothers command the two. And Custer never goes with the main force. He goes with them, so he's never in danger. And then basically all these soldiers die, and just as the Indians are about to overrun them, the other two portions of the 7th Cavalry hit them and defeat the Indians. And then Custer's such a big hero, and they just forget about that whole thing, how they had a stand-in for him. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he, he never was at the real battle. Or he wasn't at the main part of the battle. He becomes a Democratic candidate. He wins in 1876 and at least serves for two more terms and probably three. Because in this, they talk about how Ulysses S. Grant dies of failure, his memoirs uncompleted. A reference to the fact that Mark Twain was a man who pushed him in many ways to finish his memoirs, which are some of the best that you can ever read. Really? There's a great book about the story of him writing his memoirs. I just finished it not that long ago. It's called Grant's Last Victory. Hmm. Fantastic. I highly, highly recommend it. Hmm. Um, and he, Mark Twain played a huge role in him getting his memoirs done. So he doesn't. But Ulysses S. Grant dies in July of 1885. And it says that he died, and he talks about him in the past tense. So George Custer may be a three-term president, at least. Mm -hmm. Talks about how he's just like filled with, it's rife with corruption, and mm -hmm. it's very poorly run government. But there's this whole conspiracy, and eventually <laughs> Mark Twain comes back, and he confronts his like publisher of the newspaper he works for, and he's like, of course it's a conspiracy! <laughs> and then talks about how we rigged this so we could get a Democrat elected <laughs> to, uh, to the presidency. Yeah, those damn Republicans. It's so funny, because all he says is... You know, Custer's a fraud. And he's like, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course he is. It's like a movie villain. The, the like, Bond villain. It's yeah. like uh, Operation Grand Slam. Let me tell you what that is. Uh. <laughs> yeah, no. But yeah, it talks about Custer's just this fraud and all that. And <laughs> very fortuitous that all these, and he runs into Marcus Reno in a bar in Washington. And he confirms everything about it being like, I was paid off. Like, mm -hmm. this is all fake, pretty and then, much. And then he starts yeah. coughing up blood, which I think is kind of an implication that he's been poisoned. Yeah. You know? What's the chances he's going to die? consumption. He's got a touch of consumption. Oh, no. Like a... Like Charlie does in that episode of It's Always Sunny, oh. where he vomits all over the lady and goes, I've got a touch of consumption. <laughs> Great scene. But uh, yeah, no, this one's interesting. Yeah, but I love how everyone's just like, -ha 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 -ha. we'll tell you all about our evil plans. I'm so evil. Just our victory is so assured, I'll just tell you precisely what's going to happen. You can't do anything about it, Mark. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Same but old. he talks about Mark Twain is like, well, I don't run well in military circles. Mark Twain actually was a soldier in yes. the Confederacy. And I was about to say in World War II. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. My brain has become addled. Um, you're, you're, you're inventing your own alternate histories. Know, that's yeah. right. What if Samuel Clemens fought in World, World War II? II. Well, you know, the possibilities are if, endless. What if Samuel Clemens had a tank at a... <laughs> <laughs> and Galgamela. Uh, Galgamela, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is really interesting. I liked it because the whole point is like, George Custer pops up a lot in these books and we're yeah. going to review the other two as our plan, I think, eventually. Mm -hmm. And he pops up in a big way in one of the other ones. Mm -hmm. and a different story. Not to mention he's in like, what, six of the Southern Victory books? Yeah. Like, holy crap. Well, he's just a convenient alternate character because yeah. he died so ridiculously somewhat and he's such a bombastic character yeah. too and he's like uh, he, he stands out because he was like this very like he was like love newspaper attention and he um you know he was the goat at west point which is that's the person who graduates at the bottom of their class <laughs> he received like the most demerits ever but still managed to graduate <laughs> but he was also a general he was born in 1839 and by 1863 at the battle of gettysburg he is a general and then they demote him yeah yeah, why? that's why he was a lieutenant colonel. Because uh, those were brevet ranks, so during the war, like you mm -hmm. know, they were promoted on sort of like a, we need more people, but this isn't going to be a rank in the long term. It's not a permanent promotion, so they'd have a permanent rank they would revert to back 
and the regular army. And his was like captain. Hmm. Like from like a brigadier general to the captain. <laughs> so, yeah. This is a huh. good story. It's interesting. But it's really, I like, it's a little bit different from the other ones that it's really more about like the effects of this battle and how it's not really about the battle itself. Though, though you wanted to like tell, not show. But this might tell a little too much, just mm-hmm. with people just like monologuing yeah, about. Yeah. Oh, by the way, here's our whole conspiracy to rig the presidential election. Well, as you know, let me recite the official story. Yeah, da, da, da. yeah but it, but it's fine. I like this story. I think yeah. it's 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 a good story. It's it's one of the best in yeah. the collection. And Rutherford Hayes doesn't become president, which I think is a good thing any day. Of the yeah, week. that's definitely the best part of this whole thing. It was all worth it, really. Mm-hmm. You know. Have the Illuminati fix the election just as long as Rutherford B. Phrase doesn't doesn't get in there. That's right. Also, I just want to point out that uh, you know it's really too bad Turtle Dove didn't write this story because then we could have had yet another hot, sexy Mark Twain sex scene, <laughs> just like we had in How Few Remain. <laughs> Ew. Oh boy, just I really want that. Her just uh, what, oh God, what was the name of his wife in that book? I don't remember. It's I not the same remember. lady he's married to who he was married to in reality. Yeah. They talk about his wife leaving him in this after he wrote Huckleberry Finn. He's like, everyone wanted to leave me, including my wife. And it, and, and yet, Audie loves Huckleberry Finn. And says well, he likes he Tom really, Sawyer. He likes Tom Sawyer. He's right. Tom Sawyer. Ah. He's like, Hasn't everyone, anyone ever read something in dialect? Like, of course I know how to write better than this. <laughs> uh, classic. Yeah. Uh, this is now, I think we're going to get to the end of the stories we're going to talk about in detail here. Ah. Vati, which is German. For daddy. For daddy, yes. (laughs) Vati. Um, Well, Vati, oh, I'm so excited to talk about this one. Because Vati, the point of divergence is, if you ever heard of someone named Werner Mulders, Werner Mulders was the first great German ace of World War II. He was the leading ace of this Condor Legion in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. He was the first German pilot to shoot, score more than more victories than the Red Baron, to pass the Red Baron, and the first pilot to score more than 100 victories, air-to-air victories. He died flying back to Ernst Udet, who was a, the second highest scoring German ace of the First World War, committed suicide in November 1941. Werner Mulders flies back from the Russian front to come to his funeral, and his plane crashes and he dies. Well, in this one, it doesn't crash. He doesn't die. And he takes over Udet's position. And he decides that he is going to switch stuff up a little bit. <laughs> He's going to make some bold changes uh-huh. to the way the Germans run the war. Air doctrine changes in a very big way. Mm-hmm. They, uh, you know, they they really emphasize a certain machine, a certain airplane. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I think I may have forgotten the name. What what is this called again? Uh, is it uh, an ME-262? Oh, that's right. It's an ME-262. <laughs> finally. Finally. Finally, an alternate history that would address such a important machine. Yes. Nothing, uh, no one else has ever talked about this before. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. new territory we're it's, talking it's about It's really a, a, an underappreciated <laughs> part of World War II. Um, yes. So it's 1944, and the, the Allies are building up to the invasion, and then they see, what's in the sky? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it Superman? No. Look at those shark wings. ME 262s. Oh my God. So basically, Mulders uses them to take, you know, another Battle of Britain, another Connell Kampf. Yeah. You know, so they start <laughs> launching a bombing raid supported by the ME 262s, trying to sink the ships that are gathering in the harbors and attacking things. There's a great part where he's talking to Hitler, shows Hitler like a picture of like troop transport ships filled with people. And he's like, where'd you get this? And he's like, I took it myself this morning. <laughs> like he's such like an action movie hero. Yeah. But, and they prioritize other things like the Arado AR is a 234 jet bomber. And they cause a lot of damage. So much so that the D-Day invasion never gets started. Because they don't have air superiority. They don't have air superiority. He's causing all this damage and they can't cross over. And eventually he resigns his position because... Hitler asked for like his undying, like, you know, some sort of commitment. And he's like, I want you to renounce God. Yeah, pretty much is what he asked. Him when he's, and, and Werner Mulders was Catholic. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. So he resigns it and joins Adolf Galan's, what I would guess is the equivalent of what was called JV-44, Jager, Jager Ver, Ver, Verband 44, which was a jet fighter unit formed in the end of World War II basically made up of all aces and very experienced pilots. All the ME-262s were concentrated there. So all the greats, German fighters, 
of the war, Galland at the time, Johannes Steinhoff, Eric Rudorfer, Heinrich Barr, and all these, the most famous of the aces. And there's some equivalent of it that Galland has here. And Mulders keeps fighting, and they just keep on causing damage. But he talks about how they're on the other side of the Alps, the Allies. And then there's the bear out on the Eastern Front. The great bear. The great bear pushing in. And then the, the British are still bombing them at night. Yeah. Because your ME-262s are great at the day, but you still haven't figured out how they work at the night. Well, put those, like, antler-looking thing, radar things on the front. I mean, doesn't that work? How does radar even work? So, okay, when you're in a fighter, it's World War II. Mm -hmm. How do you see the radar? Is it like a little spinny thing? It's the old, yeah, the old... Yeah. But no, that's because... Well, when it's the spinny thing, that's because the radar thing is spinning. But if you're in a plane, it's just know. straightforward. Is it just like it gets greener if I there's guess. metal in front of you? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, know. I don't know. I've always wondered how that worked. But the long, yeah, the long story short is he resigns his position and they're fighting and they keep fighting. And he talks about his 45 and he can hear the, the growl of those white right engines when the Wehrmachts, the superforts, arrive in 45 <laughs> to, um, to really punish the Germans. And yeah. it's like talking about at the end. Like Hitler's talking about there'll be a new day for Germany. A new dawn for A Germany. new dawn, yes. It's like, it's like, and then the next night over Dresden, the dawn came early, brighter than a thousand suns. Period. End of book. Yes! <laughs> ah, ah! Last page. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically the Allies still win because... Hmm. Because bomb. A bomb. A bombs. Yeah. Yes. So why would they bomb Dresden with an A bomb? Yeah. Why don't you go to Berlin? Yeah. Cut yeah. the cut the head off the snake. You yeah. Know? Maybe because Dresden was an untouched city, so they want to show some real destruction. I don't think Germany's gonna gonna sign a peace if the Allies mm-hmm. haven't even done a cross channel invasion yet. They're yeah. still occupying all of France and all of Germany. You're gonna have to use a few more, like that story from Hitler Victorious, where it takes eleven atom bombs. <laughs> <laughs> and like fighting into 1947 to break the Germans just because they have ME 262. It's, damn, what a good plane, I guess. <laughs> it's a fine plane. It is a fine plane. Um, Almost like the ME 163 Comet, the rocket fighter mm-hmm. that the Germans used. Where well, it wasn't a jet engine, it was just a rocket. <laughs> what is that the. Uh, that short, stubby looking thing that took off on like skis and. Oh, a fui. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, Wien V Ein Flow Aber a Ho. It's like uh, like a fly, but but O. Oh. But O. Oh. <laughs> yeah. If you see the insignia for that group, it's like a flea that looks like it's farting itself into space. Because <laughs> um, it's supposed to be the rocket engine, but it looks a whole lot like a flea <laughs> farting itself on a vertical, like in a like in a like forty five degree angle into space. And uh, the ace who kills himself, I cannot remember his name, but they talk about how he was flying an HE one eleven. Ernst Udet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, Ernst Udet, yeah. The second highest scoring German ace of World War I. Completely unknown these days, but a very famous barnstormer pilot in between the wars. And he At air shows? Mm-hmm. Huh. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. In Europe, not in the US. <laughs> well, yeah. Udet, yeah, he committed suicide in November 1941. There's various reasons, partially because he was alleged to be homosexual, partially because some people said he thought, like, Germany's going to lose the war. Mm-hmm. In 1941, I mean... Mm-hmm. Well, maybe. I don't know. Hmm. But how would he know? I don't know. Good guess. Hmm. It's a good one. I like it. Hmm. It's got an ME-262 in it. What could be wrong with it? I, there's nothing wrong with it. It's Hundreds perfect. of ME-262s. This is, this is the greatest story I've ever read in my life, really. <laughs> we see now he just has to write the part two mm-hmm. where they still win, even though they're getting nukes, hundreds just of nukes drops. <laughs> yeah, over. Just left and right. <laughs> That's a good story. But it uh, but it doesn't take into account the Allies are going to invade. And if they can't go through Normandy, they're going to land in southern France. Southern There's France. going to be yeah. a jacked up version of Ample Dragoon. Ample Dragoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See if you can get your jet fighters down to Toulon and Marseille. <laughs> and, um, and Werner Mulders was a very famous figure at the time, but he obviously lost the attention because there were many pilots who scored many more victories than he did. But what, what is it, Eric? Whatever, Eric Hartman, Eric the Hartman, ace yeah. of all time. Yeah, it's uh, well. This is a great story collection. Yeah, I like it a lot. I can't wait to get to the other two because yeah. there's some even crazier <laughs> stories. It started pretty tame in this, and then it starts to get a little out of hand, but it's great. <laughs> The covers are fantastic. Yeah. They really know how to make a book cover. Yeah, except none of them actually happen in any of the stories. <laughs> There's never a story in any of them that accurately reflect the cover. Uh, so, no, great stories. And Harry Turtledove, nothing wrong with that. 
Do we want to touch on any of the uh, stories that we didn't really talk about? Yeah, there's a couple other ones that we didn't really read that much. Or it's been a long time since at least I've read them. Yeah, I, th- I was reading them for the first time and I wasn't able to get to all of them. There's one, Vive le Admiral, which is Lord Nelson. He's not a Lord Nelson. He's... Citizen Nelson. Citizen. <laughs> Citizen on mission Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Working for the French. Ah. Uh-huh. And yet he still has his eye and his arm off and he dies in kind of the same way and it's mm-hmm. like hmm, huh. yeah. <laughs> it's fate i guess the the craft of war which i read was about sun Tzu helping the persians conquer greece or something <laughs> which that's that's a deadliest warrior episode yeah, right there oh uh, where's vlad the impaler <laughs> <laughs> his tiny gun yeah his very small gun <laughs> uh, but um great collection I guess we're not going to talk about all the stories because this is going to be like reading Rainbow, where we're going to be LeVar Burton saying, if you want to know everything that happened in this collection, read it for yourself. Yes. So do it. So do it. (laughs) Or else. Do it. Do the do. Do it. There is one in there that I'll just touch on very briefly. It's called The Case for Justice. It's about Jan Smoots, who is a very influential figure in South Africa. And something's alternate. But I can't tell what is. And that is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Too long. It's also really, really long mm-hmm. story. Short story. Short story. They say is uh, brevity is the soul of wit. Good old Bill Shakespeare said that. <laughs> Bill Shakespeare. Billy Shakespeare. Yeah. You mean Joseph Fiennes. Joseph Fiennes. And Shakespeare in Love. Oh, no. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's Ralph Fiennes. Voldemort, yeah, the guy who played Voldemort. Uh, or whatever. <laughs> Ray finds his first role was as T.E. Lawrence in A Dangerous Man, Lawrence After Arabia, which was a made-for-TV sequel to Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> oh, jeez. What? It also had Alexander Siddig in it, who was in Star Trek Deep Space Nine and a huh. bunch of other random things. Interesting. It's a good guy. Well, um, if you want to contact us via email... Mm-hmm. You can do it via talkingithistory at gmail.com. We also set up a Patreon. It's really awesome. The people who have given money, it's it's really great. We've uh, started putting stuff on SoundCloud now. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and mm-hmm. you're on the go, you can just listen to the SoundCloud yeah. thing. You don't have to watch this video. Yeah, beginning of our career of SoundCloud rappers, Max. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be us and uh, uh, Takeshi69. <laughs> And uh, oh, Icy Narco and, yeah, uh, yeah Little Peep and you know, yeah, all, the, because all the greats. Because the, the twist of the story is we actually have more face tattoos than all of them. Oh, that's true. I have a face tattoo of Anne Frank as well on my <laughs> face. <laughs> oh, geez. oh, no. Just the right way to honor the, <laughs> the memory of this Holocaust victim. <laughs> Yep. What if he'd gotten a tattoo of Anne Frank's house on his face instead? Oh, yeah, yeah. Get a face tattoo of um, uh, Marshall Smigley Rids on his face. That'd be good. <laughs> Yay, Poland forever. Um, Polska. Yeah, talking about quick, quick tangent, Poland forever. Watch that really cool Sean Bean pump-up video about Poland <laughs> and World War II that's on YouTube. And you're just like... Poland? Yeah! yeah. I'm not even Polish. And <laughs> You're like, yeah, I'm proud of Poland. Hell yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I quite like Poland. And then there's a Mel Gibson video where it's narrated the whole time talking about, have you ever been away from home for a long time? Now imagine being away from home for 123 years. <laughs> That's what happened to Poland. So go visit Poland. So visit Poland, <laughs> yes. Let's celebrate Poland together. Come visit me, Mel Gibson. <laughs> Fame Polish American, Mel Gibson. <laughs> Gibson. <laughs> At least get a Polish actor. Come on. Who are they going to get? The guy that plays Darth Maul. Isn't he Polish? I think he's English, but yeah, also Polish. A, a Polish ancestry. There's a lot of English Poles. Mm-hmm. Who's a Polish actor? Uh, <laughs> uh, um... um <laughs> Uh, what's his uh? uh Charles Bronson. He's yes. Polish. Oh, Lithuanian, I think actually. Oh no. Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, close enough. Uh, they... What's the guy with the big, the crazy mustache? Marshall. Whatever. What's he in? No, he was the guy who was the head of Poland in the interview. Oh, Pilsudski. Pilsudski. Oh get yeah. Him. Get, get him a back. get a hologram of Marshall Pilsudski. <laughs> <laughs> 
it this year at Coachella. <laughs> Phil Sutsky shows up with Tupac. <laughs> Tupac is alive in Poland. <laughs> Come to Krakow. Come to Krakow. <laughs> Come to Rockclaw. <laughs> Yeah. Coachella 2018. <laughs> Lala Palooza. Oh my god. Lala Polandooza. <laughs> Lala Polska Lusa. <laughs> uh, I love Pilsudski. Man, that guy. I like that guy. He's a cool looking guy. Do you know Hitler went to his funeral? Oh, okay. And then, like, three years later... <laughs> we invaded your country. We're back! Psych! <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't like Poland at all. Yeah. It was just a prank, bro. <laughs> it was a social experiment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Just but definitely watch that pump-up video on there. It's great. You know, that, that you're like, yeah. Yes, Poland. Yes, Poland. Yes. Um, you know, I was thinking back and I think the reason why Mel Gibson is in that Poland ad is because he's Catholic and Poland is a very, very Catholic country. So, you know, it makes sense. Or at least it's a Catholic country now, but you go back 1000 plus years ago and not so much some kind of, uh, like either Slavic or Baltic paganism was in that area like a, um, what is it, Remova or Rodnaveri or something like that. Tree religions, basically. Paganism. Oh boy. We love the trees. Get, get, uh, get St. Boniface in here. You're worshiping that tree? Guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> yeah, your tree's doing a whole lot to stop me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that the Saxons worship some sort of holy tree or pillar, mm-hmm. and Charlemagne had that crap cut right down. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Those um, Avars, man. Never met an Avar I liked, Max. Aversion to Avars, you could even say. Aversion to Avars. <laughs> mm. The Avar Kaganate. Yeah. Kaganate? That's what it was called, yeah. Kaganovich? Lazar Kaganovich? What? Oh my god. Uh, oh no. Those Huns. Those tree worshipping communists. Yeah, that's uh. right, yes. Actually, communists have a horrifically bad yeah, ecological record. record. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's what Trotsky is all about—the conquest of man over nature. Really? And the conquest of ice picks over skulls. <laughs> the conquest of man over the Aral Sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're doing a pretty good job of that one, ladies and gentlemen. We got him. <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished. <Yeah. laughs> Oh, yeah, so Trotsky. What a guy. You mean Lev Bronstein? Yes, yes. This is a Lev Bronstein. Bronstein. This is a pro Bronstein. Pro Bronstein, anti Trotsky. What? Oh, no. Yeah. What's, is Trotsky mean something? No, I don't, I don't a know. Na, a nom de guerre. A nom, oh, yeah. A nom de plume. Nom, nom de, plume. de guerre. Sure, it's a de plume. He wrote books under it also. Sure, why not? My life. Leon Trotsky, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, Leon. I don't want to alienate people who are Trotskyists. Or <laughs> Trotskyites. Or just, Foul Trotskyites. I mean... We're Mensheviks on this we're podcast. To say, yes, this is a left SR podcast. <laughs> we're actually a cadet podcast. Uh, we don't like the czar, but we want a constitutional uh, uh, monarchy and the state Duma democratically elected. That's We that's want Kerensky. We that's who we want. Oh, no. That, that socialist revolutionary scumbag? No way. Uh, <laughs> We're greens. We're not reds. Yes. I want La- uh, 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 Laver Kornilov. I want Kornilov <laughs> to be in charge. Yes. 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 The, 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 vo- the, vo- the vo- V-O-Z-H-D. It means boss. <laughs> the Vojd. Vo- the Vojd. Vo- that's yeah. what they called Stalin too. I thought. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an older, it's an old, old term for just guy who's like Hefe or Führer. Oh. You could even say Hefe. also. That's what Ron Perlman calls Blade. Blade. Really? Hefe. Ah, in talking about Gettysburg the movie, I okay. forgot a really crazy connection in it. Mm-hmm. So in it, the movie Gettysburg. So the main right hand of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is Captain Ellis Spear. And he calls him Ellis all the time. He's the one who leads the, you know, 
right wheel and they charge and we swing like a door and they sweep them down. We'll sweep them give down them the, the hill. Give them the cold steel, boys. Give them the, the cold, cold steel. steel. So the other guy who's leading him, Ellis Spear, is played by a guy named Donald Logue. Donald Logue is an actor who's in a lot of stuff. He's in Gotham right now. Mm-hmm. Donald Logue is also in the movie Blade. Really? He plays the guy that Blade's <gasps> chopping up all the time and comes back and then eventually kills at the end oh. by by um, by clotheslining him with a garrote. That's fantastic. Set off. That is the same guy. Oh, man. That's great. If only the I got his pig sticker guy <laughs> was also in Gods and Generals. Generals. <laughs> I got his Yankee sticker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the guy who got, the I got his pig sticker guy is actually in Blade 2. Is he? Yeah, he's the one with the. He's the one who tells uh, Chris Christopherson, "You're one pair away from hillbilly heaven." That guy is. I got his pig sticker guy. But he doesn't talk the way he did in the first movie. I know. He's. I got his pig sticker. Got his pig sticker. And, and then, then he's, he's like, after his hand gets cut off, he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's a what joke. A, like, what a bunch uh, of weirdos. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jeff Daniels is also in. Later. Oh, is he? Yeah. <laughs> Damaskinos. He was actually Damaskinos. No, much. no. He was. Um, he did a great job playing the pillar that Blade gets tied behind. Just yeah. <laughs> he was actually the young black girl who <laughs> yeah. does kung fu. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then he punches in the face. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What a wonderful See, film. See, Thomas Howell plays uh, Tom Chamberlain. See, mm-hmm. Thomas Howell, you may know from um, Red Dawn. Okay. Um, Soul Man. That movie where he's a white guy who becomes black. Is wait, wait, is that a? Is it, wait, I'm trying to remember now. Wait, wait, was that? Wait, yeah, wait a second. There was an. There's like a movie where an old man and he switches with um. Who does he switch with? Who's the actor who plays him? It's like they switch bodies or whatever, right? His soul, their souls switch. Am I thinking of the right movie? No, I don't think so. Oh my no, god! Soul Man is where he's like the rich, spoiled white guy, and he becomes a black guy because he takes some medicine or something, and he becomes black. He takes medicine and he becomes black. Yeah, I guess so. And he changes actors though, right? No, no, no. It's just C. Thomas Howell in blackface. Oh, oh god! Is this would this movie made in the seventies? Eighty six, I think. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Oh god. What about um? Well, what, what the hell movie am I thinking of? There's a. Uh, um, oh, you thinking of that Chris Rock movie? Yes, where... the Chris Rock movie. <laughs> yeah. It was yes. No, that's um, that's the one where he's like in the old guy's house and he's like, "Give me CNN, give me ESPN, give me BET," and it's BET. like we don't have that channel. <laughs> Classic. Uh, in Suicide Squad, a fine film, Suicide Squad, mm-hmm. Killer Croc. Is a character in that film. He's part of the 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 the, the Suicide Squad. Mm-hmm. I which... know. I saw that movie on a plane. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they might have cut this part out. Um, no, where he says, "What do you want?" B T. Yeah. <laughs> He's watching like butts. <laughs> oh, oh, p- mm. uh, That's yeah. Adewale Akinu Agbaje. Has he been in anything else? Uh, the TV show Oz. He was the bad guy in The Mummy 2. Wait, wait is he out of Bussy in out of Oz? Ba- yeah, out of BC in wow. Oz. Cuts a man's head off. A cop's head off. A cop's head off. He says, yeah. I'm a cop. And then he smiles and cuts his head off. Yeah. And he has that little hat. That little we can't tiny. ever figure out how it stays on his, the side of his head. Yeah. Double-sided tape. That's <laughs> yeah, my probably. guess. Yeah. yeah. He said he learned it. Not learned it. Or he saw it some... Actual Nigerian gangsters wore their hat like that. And he wouldn't tell people the secret, but probably double-sided tape sounds like a pretty reasonable explanation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but how much trouble is that every day to take a piece of tape and then put it on your head and then stick a little hat on top of it? You got, I got to, I got to trade my honey buns for more double-sided tape, tape that's yeah, been smuggled buns, in. My soups, my I soups. Need my soups. Yeah. Um, I need to call my my girlfriend to put more money on my card. Yeah, put money, more money on my, put more minutes on my phone, please. <laughs> um, yeah. Or we could write uh, children's books. That's true, yeah. Another guy. And then I took out my crocodile Dundee knife and told him, welcome to my torture chamber, bitch. <laughs> it's for the children, Max. But the content <laughs> is less than family friendly. <laughs> um, 
Lockup is an amazing Lock up. television Man, show. there is just, truth is truly stranger than fiction. It, and there's yeah. just so many good stories waiting to be told in America's. Um, well, not anymore. They canceled it. I know. Damn it. It's done. It's a damn I shame. Just go to Miami Super Jail with yeah, Louis Thoreau. <laughs> or just do yeah, a crime and go to jail. Go to jail. Yeah, right now. Live, live it. Live it. Yeah. <laughs> live on the edge. Oh no! I think we're in the yeah. We've we've run this we've run this train about as far as it can run. Yes, this is the, this armored train has run as far as it can go. My boy Trotsky here is at the helm, and he says, "There's no more coal left. I'm <laughs> sorry, you guys. You gotta you gotta go home now." Mm-hmm. So, um, well, this is a wonderful episode. I can't mm-hmm. wait for the next installment of Alternate Generals. Neither can I. Yeah. Well, this is Matt. Signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys.